Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear the transforming joy which you say to us today. Amen. I'm going to be reading Acts 16, 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. <clears throat> there stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. Remain, we remained on this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went to the outside gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman, women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening, listening to us, she was from the city of Thyatira, I think I said that right, and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you happen to come up here, you will notice that we have a pronunciation sheet. Elizabeth, you got them all. <laughs> you did great. Those are some <laughs> hard words. And I, I ended up reading the scripture this morning and I thought, oh, I'm so glad I'm just reading this. Because if you back up, you pick up some more. Things like Bithynia. And I'm not even, I don't know if that and Phrygia, and all those places. So I'm glad you started at, at verse 9. It made it much easier. And as we look at this this morning, what we're going to do is, these few verses you read, gladly, uh, we're going to look at them exegetically. That means we're going to take a look at them and just kind of pick it apart just a little bit because it can be kind of biblically fun. To see what all is happening there. Then we're going to look at it as an example of what you and I. And how you and I can be a mission to the world. And then we're going to look for the excitement and the expectation involved there. So now you know what we're doing. We're starting out with the exegetical part. And one of the coolest things in here. If you were paying close attention to the pronouns. Is that at verse 11. She said we. At verse 11, it says that we set, we set sail from Troas and made this direct voyage. We did it. That's the first time you get we in the book of Acts. Up until this point, Luke, who wrote Acts, has been talking about this, talking about what's going on. Peter did this, and so-and-so did that, and this and the other happened. But when you get to verse 11 of chapter 16, Luke dives into the action. It's like he's been going along and says, oh yeah, I was there. He puts himself there. And there's some folks say, well, he just wrote it that way as a literary device. Others say it really was there. I kind of like the idea that it really was there. He put himself into the action. He was part of what God was doing through these folks. We, he says. And if you back up to that part that Elizabeth did not have to read, and I know you're praising God because there's some doozies. Um, if you back up to that part, you read that, that we discern. The vision, and, and not we, but that people discern together which way we ought to go, what it is we ought to do. This is where Luke gets involved, and it's a beautiful thing. So Luke is now involved, and, and so that's, that's one thing. Then if you calm down, just you notice that they say they go to Philippi. 
which is the leading city of the District of Macedonia and a Roman colony. That's the only city that is identified in the New Testament as a Roman colony. Luke's doing that because the people of Philippi want you to know they're a Roman colony. Because you see, they're on the edge of the Roman Empire. So they are more Roman than the Romans. Because they want to be able to look at their neighbors and they wear their togas and the whole nine yards and say, I'm a Roman and you're not. They're proud of it. So Luke makes sure to throw that in. So, and then you come further down and at the very end, you hear that she prevailed upon them. She really, really wanted them to stay in her house. You know, if you look at the back of your bulletin on the very bottom, there's information about the word prevailed. It only shows up a couple of times in all of the New Testament. And I think that in the other places in Luke 24, 29, when they're on the Emmaus Road, and the, and the disciples were prevailing upon Jesus to stay the night because it's dangerous out there. That's kind of neat. That verbal echo. Whenever somebody responds to the presence of Christ upon them and their first thing that they do is prevail upon Christ to stay with them. That's just an interesting little thing to know. So then we move into how is this an example for me and for you? Well, you see, they went into the town and it says that they remained there for some days. If you're reading this in the message, it says they lingered there. Now, it wasn't like they were standing there just twiddling their toes. They were getting to know the people, getting to know the lay of the land. How else would they know that there's supposed to be a prayer meeting? And that's kind of what it was, a prayer meeting there at the edge of the river where people were going to come and gather to pray, that they would find people there who knew the Lord. They were getting the lay of the land. And whenever you and I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to go and, and form relationships, find out who we're dealing with so that we can speak a language and speak in terms that are understood. That's what they did. And Lydia was already prepared. Her heart was prepared to hear the word of God. To hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and they spoke it truly to her. And she responded by first being baptized and secondly by opening her home. The first convert in Europe, her response was to be baptized and then to act in Jesus' name. To open her home, to practice hospitality and give of herself. That's beautiful. And it is an example to embrace. The excitement of the passage comes from the encounter with the Holy Spirit. Ah, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us energy and, and inspires us and guides us and lifts us. All along, they have known that they wanted to share the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you back up in that part that we didn't read, you find that they tried to go here. And that, that didn't work. So then they tried to go here. But the Spirit of God prevented them from going where they decided that they would go. Have you ever felt that way? You've got this idea of something you need to do. And you try it this way and it doesn't work. Try it this way and it doesn't work. Try it that way and it doesn't work. But when the Spirit of God gets involved, you know which way to go. That's what happened. The Spirit of God guided them through this vision of a man from Macedonia. And great things happened. Lives were touched. You know, it's kind of weird to think about it, but in some ways, you and I are here today because they responded to that vision. Went to Europe, and this woman heard what they had to say and responded positively. Wow. What can happen when the Holy Spirit gets involved? But this past week, I didn't feel it so much. I confess that this past week I just felt kind of dry and out there. 
And so I tried on my own to kind of generate a little excitement and some spirit, but it wasn't really coming. And on Thursday morning, I had to go to a clergy meeting. Once a month or so, we all get together at a different church, and we have worship, and then we have a meeting part, and then we eat lunch. And I got there, and I was like, oh man, here we go, another meeting, okay. Well, it was at Wesley United Methodist Church on Meeting Street downtown. Beautiful little church. And, but you had to park, and you, Meeting Street's here, and it backs up on Nassau Street. And it ended up back there on Nassau Street. And I came around, and I eased on in. I found me a little parking place. And I looked around, and I thought, this isn't where I usually go. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on Nassau Street, but it's probably not somewhere you frequent. Because the building right beside the church needs to be condemned if it hasn't been, because the balcony's fallen off, and the windows are boarded up and broken. And there's other places, and you could just feel it felt dangerous. It felt totally outside of where I expected to be. I sent a message to Wayne just to let him know where I was because I was a little bit scared. But I went on around, and I went in the front door of the church, and it's very different. Because whenever you walk in at St. Mark, we have this lovely narthex for you to come in and, and where you can greet and shake hands and all that kind of stuff. But I opened the door of that church and I stepped in and there was the pew. And a lady said, there's pastries back there if you want some. I don't want any pastries. I was running late. So I went and I got my name tag and I put my name tag on and I went and I sat down. Because, well, they gave me a little order of worship thing. And I looked at the ceiling, and it was, a, it was triangular, and it was wooden, and it was beautiful. And I remember thinking, well, man, if we go really get singing in here, that sound is going to be something else. And then worship started. And it started out, and we sang, Blessed Assurance. Well, we sang it all the way through. And the man that was playing the piano, and it's not a piano like we have. This one was one of those old-timey pianos that still had that tinnish kind of sound. And he'd play that thing, and he played it with energy, and he played it with the spirit, and he played it with hope, and the music started, and we sang that song all the way through, and then we came back and sang it again. And the spirit got involved about then for me. Because whenever you get a bunch of Methodist clergy together, we can sing. Well, they can sing. And those men that always sit in the back, they get kind of reared back and they let those voices out and it goes up and it comes back and it, oh, it is an amazing thing to hear the Methodists sing. You're going to sing again in a few minutes, by the way. And then we finally finished singing. And we got, got to the part, and, and the liturgist said, now, and she said, now you know, usually in, in the black church, we sing our preachers up. And the preacher was sitting over here. So she started us off singing this little light of mine. And by this point, we had deviated from the order of worship that was printed. And we sang verses of this little light of mine that I had never heard in my whole life. And we just sang and sang, and there was clapping, and we were, and it was, it was, my hair started standing up because I knew the Spirit of the Lord was in that place. And then he stood up, and he began to preach out of John 14, where Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And he says, My peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. And the Spirit of God came on me and all that jangled stuff that had been bothering me all week, I felt the peace of God. And it was good. And as he preached, he spoke of the men and the women. And he asked God to be with them that they would hear God's call. And he preached to the young people that they would hear God's call on their lives. And then he preached to the boys and the girls. And there weren't any there, but he preached to them anyway. And he spoke that they would respond to God calling them. And my heart fluttered. Because at Revolution this year, three... Young people from St. Mark responded said, saying that they had felt the tug of God on their hearts into ministry. 
into ordained ministry. Not one, not two, but three. Somebody ought to say praise God. And it came upon me that my prayer too is that the Spirit of God would bathe these young people with hope and with encouragement. But also that we as a church would put ourselves under them, beside them, around them. That they would respond to God's call on their lives to be in whatever ministry they're called to. But that's not enough. Because God calls all of us into some kind of ministry. And on that day, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I could feel hope. And the holiness of the moment was with me. And I knew that God had called me and God had called you to do something. And I knew by the Spirit that we are not called and then left alone. But we are called and we are equipped and we are empowered by the Spirit. Our part is to respond to it. Our part is to respond to what God is calling us to do. What's God calling you to do this day? Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Amen.